Hello everyone and welcome to the ODI Friday Lunchtime Lecture. Um, I'm Annalisa, I'm working in the commercial team here at ODI and I would like to introduce our speakers, uh, Natalie Byron from uh, the Legal Education Foundation and Renata Samson from the ODI. Um, before letting them introduce our question today, uh, I just would like to do a bit of housekeeping and reminding, to, reminding you to uh, ask him the questions at the end of the session so that we can facilitate the Q&A and I can <laughs> Great. Should I keep going? Okay, I keep going. And um, and I will just circulate the microphone so that you can ask the questions. And uh, I would also like to remind the people who are live streaming right now that they can um, ask their questions or leave us comments with the hashtag ODI Fridays on Twitter. That's great. <laughs> Off we go. Right. Hi, everyone. So my name is Dr. Natalie Byram, and I'm Director of Research at the Legal Education Foundation. I'm so pleased to be here today to speak at the launch of this fantastic report, despite my lingering qualms that I'm not quite cool enough to enter Hackney. So I hope yeah, I managed to get through. So there we go. Uh, myself and my brilliant colleague, Sui Leng Harris, who's here today, um, co-commissioned this piece of work. And we've been so delighted to work with the team at ODI on this. And I'd like to start by thanking Renata, Adafe, Ben, Finton, Walter and Jenny for all of their hard work in pulling this report together. This issue is of such importance to the foundation and the frontline organisations that we support and we're so grateful to you for giving this topic the time, attention and platform that it really deserves. Now, I don't want to take up too much time because I'd rather we all got on to discussing the findings, but I thought it would be really helpful. Um, to just explain who the foundation is and why we were keen to fund the report and why we think tackling this issue is of such importance. So, who are we? Um, the Legal Education Foundation is an independent grant-making trust and we're committed to using legal education to build a just and fair society. Every year we award up to £5 million in grants to organisations who work to deliver this vision. In January 2020, so still this month, just about, uh, we launched our new five-year strategy. Over the next five years, um, we'll be focusing on supporting work across three programmes. Um, building a stronger sector, so providing training and support for organisations uh, working in the social justice legal sector. Fairer systems, which focuses on ensuring that government systems uphold the principles of transparency, accountability and protect human rights. And Smarter Justice, which aims to bring about a cultural shift in the availability and use of e robust evidence in the design of the justice system. As you can probably guess, the report today sits at the intersection of the Fairer Systems and Smarter Justice programmes. Better data is vital to ensuring that government systems are operating fairly and to designing a justice system that works for everyone. So, why did we commission this work? I think it's relatively uncontroversial to say that there are whole areas of public policy and government services that are a black hole in terms of data. The absence of this data is hugely problematic as it prevents us from understanding the efficacy and fairness of government policy and of services. There are particular acknowledged issues with data collection and quality in relation to protected characteristics such as sex, race, age and disability. Protected characteristics are individual attributes that are set out under law. It is against the law to discriminate against someone on the basis of a protected characteristic. But 10 years on from the passing of the Equality Act, there are still huge issues in monitoring and addressing inequality. The absence of data has hampered the success of recent initiatives that aim to tackle discrimination, such as the Lamy Review in 2017, the work of the Race Disparity Unit across government, and successive inquiries by the Women and Equality Select Committee into the extent of maternity discrimination, amongst others. The rapid expansion of digital services by government offers the potential to meet people's needs in new and more convenient ways and reach people where they are. But the transition to digital also raises questions about access and fairness that can only be addressed with good data and evidence-based solutions. The redesign of government services and the creation of new digital pathways offers the opportunity to address systemic issues in relation to the absence of data, to tackle discrimination and to make services fairer. 
Low public trust in government use of data and concerns about the introduction of AI makes it more important that government services have the data to prove to people that their systems are fair and operating lawfully. In spite of the imperative to get this right and the huge opportunities emerging in this space, the Legal Found Education Foundation's own work with the court service, the Home Office and the Department for Work and Pensions suggested that this opportunity was not being seized. And the question we were asking was why? Our work with the court service, which you can read about in our report Digital Justice, which was published in October 2019, identified three key barriers to the collection of better data. Firstly, the absence of best practice and common standards for designing approaches to data collection. This means that government services who do want to collect this data are approaching data collection in an ad hoc way which undermines the quality and consistency of the data collected. It also makes it so much harder for departments because they're all starting from scratch. Um, two, a lack of awareness and good practice about how to build questions into the user journey in a manner that maximises response rate, but also builds trust that the information provided won't be used against them or form part of their case in the context of the justice system. And thirdly, concerns and myths around the General Data Protection Regulation, and we particularly welcome the assurances from the Information Commissioner that were detailed in this report. So, although the focus of this report is primarily on digital government, as the report points out, the growing use of private sector and civil society to deliver services on behalf of the state and the dominance of digital services in whole areas such as banking or finance means that we need to develop an approach that works for these sectors too. As whole service industries embrace digital delivery, how can providers be sure that they're offering inclusive services? The findings of the report that Renata will present are the beginning of an important conversation. We hope to use this report to build understanding of the problem and, crucially, the political will to fix it. Our aim is to build a community around this issue and work together to find a way forward that makes systems better and fairer for the people who use them. I'm so excited for you to hear from Renata today and I really look forward to the discussion afterwards. So, over to Renata. Thank you very much. Thank you again for that um, great introduction uh, and over, uh, overview of, of uh, the work that's done at the Legal Education Foundation. Let's see if this now works for us. Um, so, um, first of all, again, let me reiterate uh, Natalie's thanks, not just to me. I'm the project lead on, on this piece of work, but uh, to Adafe Onaheim, who is the... Is, uh, wrote and researched the report along with the team here, Ben, Finton and Walter. Um, this report's been uh, fascinating um, and we're, we're, we're very grateful and glad to work with the Legal Education Foundation on this. So the report published today and available on our website uh, is entitled Monitoring Equality in Digital Public Services. Um, whoa, and now I'm going to play some music <laughs> by the sounds of things. A little bit of jazz there just to get us all going. Uh, right. Uh, this this is the report and it looks lovely and today I'm going to basically talk you through the, the key themes, um, namely the problem, protected characteristics, why they're important, who we talk to, what we learned and what we recommend. Um, so what is the problem? Well, as Natalie's pointed out, uh, uh, a lot of the services now are becoming digital. These are essential public and indeed private sector services and these are services that traditionally you'd know who was using them because they weren't online, they're in the physical world and you could see and meet and greet and understand and talk to the people who were using the services. But now, with a lot of digital uh, uh, services, we are blind to who is using them. And this is actually quite problematic because if we don't know who's using a service, then obviously we can't ensure that they're being inclusive. And that is, as Natalie has pointed out, a, a, a legal requirement. Furthermore, we can't ensure that services aren't unintentionally or intentionally uh, discriminating against people. Uh, but these are two very, very different issues, and they both require good access to data, such as protected characteristics. Now, Natalie gave a very brief overview of what protected characteristics are. I'm going to go a little bit more detailed for you because I didn't know prior to working on this project. But there are nine protected characteristics. Uh, age. Uh, marriage or civil partnership status, uh, whether we're pregnant or have had children, 
uh, uh, our race, our religion or our, and our beliefs, uh, our disability if we have one, uh, uh, um, our sex, our sexual orientation and our gender reassignment if we have indeed undertaken gender reassignment. Now under the law, as Natalie pointed out, in, the Great, in Great Britain it is uh, unlawful to discriminate against or treat someone unfairly based on any of these protected characteristics. Now, why are they important then? Well, I mean, it is about fairness, it is about access, and it is about equality. We all have the right to be treated fairly and not to be discriminated against. Understanding the protected characteristics helps ensure that discrimination in essential services is reduced. With regards to access, services need to know who's using them. Of course, we all want to know whether who our customers are or who our users are. Uh, um, but, it, but without being able to ask and see, we A, can't determine whether or not the decisions that we're making based on who services think that they're going to be reaching out to are actually being met or not. So um, this is quite an interesting issue, and, uh, and the, um, uh, uh, the Office for National Statistics in last year, in, forgive me, in 2018, uh, uh, actually revealed that 10% of the adult UK population have experienced digital exclusion. Um, women, people over the age of 65, and those with disability are dis disproportionately excluded against it. Indeed, um, as we move into new technologies, this isn't just about understanding who's using, uh, who, who the users are. It's also about ensuring that services are built without sort of bias or issues in relation to not knowing who's using built into them. Uh, and that's going to become a much greater issue in terms of algorithms and biometric technologies going forward. Finally, with regards to equality, we need to really understand that public services are not like private services. Public services are required to be accessible and equally available to all. Private services aren't. If public services, I'm going to keep on reiterating, if they don't know who is or isn't using them, then they are failing in their legal duty. So who did we talk to? Well, Adafe did some amazing work uh, over a course of a very short period of time. She spoke to 17 people across a wide variety of different organizations. Uh, we spoke to organizations who are involved and are, are currently working in and developing good practice, such as uh, the Office for National Statistics. We spoke to organizations who were involved in implementing digital transfer transformations, such as the Government Digital Service and the Scottish Government. We spoke to people in, in, and communities, so organisations who are helping those who could potentially be harmed uh, by the collection or failure to collect protected characteristics, such as Citizens Advice, Age UK and the Royal National Institute for the Blind. And finally, we spoke to the regulators, those who provide the oversight and guidance to the law, such as the Information Commissioner's Office and the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. And this is what we found. Well, first of all, it's probably useful to know what we asked. <laughs> we asked them about equal access. We asked them about responsibility for access. Whose responsibility is it? We asked them about what data is already available. We asked them where the problems are and what the problems are. Um, but we also asked them, of course, what the opportunities are. We asked whether good practice already exists. And we also asked them to how they would handle or prevent misuse of data. And this is what we found. So... Inclusive services need to be accessible. And this isn't just a technical point. You know, lots of services now are building in things such as screen readers or ensuring that colour use on, on screens doesn't uh, 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 prevent somebody from being able to read, read the screen. But it, it's not just technical. Technical solutions are arguably easier to deal with than the social situations. Putting people first is really critical. You can have a disability for a short period of time. It doesn't have to be a permanent disability. People situations change. Lots of people, irrespective of social and economic background, don't necessarily know that a service is something that's essential to them until they happen to fall into a situation where all of a sudden it becomes an essential service. So thinking about society, thinking about people, understanding that everyone's situations is constantly changing is a key requirement in terms of building accessibility into inclusive services. Equality, it requires more than accessible design. Now, uh, there's an awful lot of work going on around disability and building services that will help people who have a disability, whether it's a permanent or a, 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 um, a temporary disability. But as we've seen, there are nine protected characteristics. And as we heard from the ONS, this is also about women, people over the age of 65. 
And yet, actually, there's a real reluctance uh, uh, to d be designing around the other eight protected characteristics. And arguably, this needs much more uh, work and attention being put towards it. We lack data. I mean, this is a theme throughout this presentation and this report. We lack data on the use of digital, ser digital services and that robust and accessible data is needed. Government digital services harmonize principles were told to us repeatedly by the people that we spoke to that they have, uh, they're a great, good, all-round practice that everybody could, could easily start to work towards and, uh, and adhere to. Data protection, uh, uh, as Natalie mentioned, there's been some real issues with people believing that the, the general data protection regulation, the GDPR, is a barrier uh, that it prevents anybody from being able to gather this data. That's not actually the case, and the Information Commissioner's Office have confirmed that to us in the report. It's not a blocker. There are, uh, the GDPR covers sensitive data, uh, uh, special category data, rather, uh, um, and the, the requirement for that data to be collected and retained specifically in relation to protected characteristics for equality purposes, it does not breach da general data protection regulations. So to even start to ensure that that is understood across the spectrum of people who are designing these services is arguably really critical. Well, it's not even arguably critical. It is critical. <laughs> data about vulnerable people needs to be handled ethically. Now, there's a whole load of work going on uh, uh, around ethics. Uh, the uh, Open Data Institute here, we have the ethics canvas. Uh, thinking about ethics is complicated, and ethics differs between everybody. Uh, but there are obviously some really key elements to it that we're all aware of and that we all need to be thinking about. And that means often putting the brakes on something and going through that and thinking it through. It is about treating people with dignity and respect. It is about upholding their rights. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, with new technologies coming through that are about uh, uh, algorithms, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, biometrics, there's a whole load of ethical questions there that we've never had to discuss before, but arguably are incredibly important in terms of being able to step back, think it through, and if sometimes that might mean changing the way you do something to ensure that you are going to be uh, handling people's data ethically, not just vulnerable people, but all of our data ethically, then uh, that's, that needs to be undertaken. There are examples out there, in, despite the fact that we lack a lot of data, there are examples of using and publishing monitoring data out there. I mean, we're not saying that there's not. Uh, Citizens Advice Bureau and GDS have done some brilliant work together, but it's not widespread and it's not consistent, and it needs to be. Finally, inclusive services need more than numbers. We heard direct, and there's some quotes in the report, that whilst quantitative data, numbers are really important, qualitative data, talking to people, understanding and identifying why they're using a service or why they're not using a service, why a service has failed for them, is really, really, really important in building. Numbers will only get you so far, but really having a chat with somebody, having a chat with groups, having a chat with organizations who are working with these groups, it is, is going to open, up, open your eyes up to a whole load of things that you might not have otherwise considered. So, Based on all of this, what are our recommendations? Well, we split our recommendations into three, uh, and they are each for a specific, a specific area, specific sector. So recommendation one is for service designers. We want you to collect data to understand your users. Now, throughout the report, the whole point of all of this is to ensure that equality monitoring, protected characteristics, adherence to the law is built into the provision of public services. But it is about sensitive data, and so this needs to be done in a measured and informed way with an emphasis on trust, ethics, and user research, as, I've, as we pointed out in the previous slide. Now, this should include ensuring choice. That means that you should ask people to provide their protected characteristics, and people should have the right to say no. And then, if they do say no, you shouldn't freak out or be worried about the fact that you haven't gathered all the data. Often understanding why people don't want to share is, a, is as important as understanding as why people do. Respecting privacy is, is, is equally important. Uh, um, there's been, there are examples out there of blind applications, for example, where 
for job applications, you've got uh, your application, but then you send separately, uh, the, the applicant is required to fill in a form about their protected characteristics that isn't linked back to their application. It's entirely separate. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's anonymous. It's blind. Um, and that's one way of being able to go around doing this in a way that might make people feel more comfortable about sharing. Because we do have to understand that for a lot of people, sharing protected characteristics makes them feel very nervous about the fact that they may be uh, exposed or treated differently uh, uh, or, or be biased against. Standards and guidance. Uh, we've, talked, we've talked about that. We, uh, there is standards out there. There is guidance out there. This needs to be much more uniform, much more regulated, uh, not regulated, much more used. Uh, service designers need to be much more aware of it. But then they also need to be transparent about what they're doing. It's all well and good to ask people to share all this information, but if you then don't publish it and be honest and shine a light on what you're doing, how are people then meant to trust that you're using it properly and that you're not exposing or undermining them? And finally, good data practice such as the reducing the risk of re-identification. Good data practices, aggregation of data, uh, handling of data properly, not being flippant or lackadaisical and considering ethics is all critical whenever we're designing any sort of a service. A second recommendation is to regulators and those other bodies that are collaborating on guidance, standards and training. Um, Gov.uk already have a design system which we think should be developed further and that this should then be used in order to train service designers to build services that collect the protected characteristics uh, uh, and understanding where people are. I mean, this, is, this, is a, this isn't a protected characteristic, and obviously location can make a lot of people very nervous, but not all services are the same across the country. As we become more uh, devolved, uh, um, people will be able to access services that others may not be able to access. So being able to understand where a user is is critical to ensure that they're going to get the right service that they require. But also, what's important is why the service has failed. It's all well and good to go, oh, I've had a great seamless experience. But if that hasn't happened for you for a wide variety of reasons that may be related to your protected characteristics, you should be able to explain why and have that heard. And the designer should be able to then respond to that. We go into much more detail about all of this in the report, and I recommend you read it because it's much more technical than I am. But uh, uh, these, are the, these are the key headline points, the final being that all, any guidance should be published, obviously, as an open standard so that we can all learn and share, uh, 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 share how to do it properly. Our final recommendation is for researchers and funders of research. We think there should be more research done. You know, it's been great that we've had this opportunity through the Legal Education Foundation, but there's a whole lot more out there. It's not just about public services, it's about private services. It's about good international practice. We read, a, we read about services uh, and practices that are happening in Canada, for example. But there's a, there's, a, there's a whole load of other untapped knowledge out there that we didn't have time to get to. It would be good to consider whether or not other characteristics should be collected. And this could be a controversial area, but understanding, uh, understanding things that, that uh, may help provide services to socioeconomic backgrounds, for, for example, uh, uh, it's, wor it's worth investigating and interrogating that further. Why people opt out. This is about comfort levels, as is trust in the monitoring process. It's all well and good to ask somebody to do something because it's of benefit to you, but also we want to understand much more why people feel uncomfortable about it. Is it a privacy thing? Is it a fear of, of, of being, falling through the cracks or being exposed? And why don't people feel trusted about this? You know, we are all now starting to level up in our understanding as to how data about us is used. Uh, but there is, because of uh, persistent misuse, mispractice, data breaches, etc., an increasing mistrust in sharing information about us. But as this is about services that can benefit all of us in society, uh, uh, developing trust and encouraging people to understand that even, although it's about them but isn't going to be identified back to them is a really important part of developing trust and improving all of our literacy. So these are our recommendations. As I say, the report goes into them in much greater detail than I've, I've given right now. Uh, the report's not that long. It's pretty straightforward. There's some pretty pictures in there. Uh, uh, um, but I would say, as a, as a final point of all of this, is um, we now have a new government, and part of that government's uh, manifesto is to create a, a society that's fairer, and also uh, to create services that are much more nuanced about us. 
Now, that's going to be an interesting process over the next few years, but an integral part of both of those elements, but particularly the fairness element, is ensuring that protected characteristics are collected and are used properly. Thank you very much. If we have any questions, Natalie and I would be happy to answer them as best we can. So, who has the first question? Thank you. Is that working? Is that okay? That was really great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion around collecting data, and we're just about to do a public event next month where, you know, we have that, where I'm having that question with students about what they can engage the public in and what they can't engage the public in. So, um, But my question is around... Um, the third recommendation, and you mentioned the um, social economic background wasn't, well, well you know, things like that, mm -hmm. that, that wasn't included. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why that wasn't included in that original list? Oh, it's not a protected characteristic. No, it's a protected characteristic, exactly. Okay. So protected characteristics are defined through the Equalities... Equality uh, Act. Yeah, so that's what we're concentrating on. The, the, the question more was... Uh, um, we're, let's figure this out, but if we want to do some further research, if people are interested in other ways of ensuring that services are fair, ensuring that services are reaching uh, 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 everyone and anyone, um, then it would be potentially of interest to, to explore different dif different characteristics that might be uh, might help with that. It's, it's just it's a thought process. Well, it's particularly relevant in the context of the move to online um, courts because one of the things that um, we've looked at certainly at the foundation um, on digital justice is that being of low income is like hugely correlated with low legal capability, no, low knowledge of rights, like low social capital, low ability to navigate those processes. And so when we were looking at how should you evaluate the impact of moving the courts online, one of the recommendations that we made there was that um, MOJ and HMCTS should actually be looking at like um, the income levels of the people who are using these services because there is a real risk that when you move um, court systems online, people on who are on higher incomes either buy their way out of them or they perform better because they're more capable. So I think, uh, but I think because there's no statutory duty to do that, what we were really focused on was this essential problem that hang on guys, it's literally the law that you're meant to monitor these things, and yet no one is monitoring them like how is that happening and, and why is that not happening and so that's why we were so grateful to have the ODI's expertise to kind of look at that question um, but I think it is it's it's a really valid point that you've raised there any other question Um, Sweeling Harris from the Legal Education Foundation. Thanks so much again to the ODI for your fantastic work. I was curious about um, the experience of the, the different communities and experts that you were speaking with I during the report mm -hmm. and the different kind of lenses and perspectives that they brought in terms of understandings of equalities, of discrimination, of protected characteristics, but also of data, of digital services and, and how these things interplay. And I just wondered if... Um, Renata, you might be able to speak to uh, w whether you got the sense that these were siloed views of the world or whether everyone understood terms uh, in the same way and, and those sort of issues. Uh, it's a very interesting question. I unfortunately didn't get the chance to speak with anyone direct. Uh, um, certain points are, are highlighted. What, what seemed to be the case was that they're... they're, they're there's an understanding that this is important. It just seems to have slipped through the cracks. Um, and I think with regards to data protection, everyone's been very keen to uh, not be um, flippant or foolish uh, with data, uh, particularly around things as sensitive as protected characteristics. So uh, people have uh, um, erred on the side of caution rather than considered the opportunities and that and that special category data uh, is required. I mean, GDPR is pretty clear uh, on how data should be used and for what purposes. It's not just all about data 
it's not. Data protection is important in terms of how it's used and how it's collected and how it's retained, but the use of it can be done in lots of ways that aren't about re-identifying people. So I think that there's, um, uh, there's been a rush over the last two years to do this all properly and things have fallen through the cracks, but through, throughout the interviews um, there, was a, there was a general sense of, of course we need to be doing this, um, but you know, we can have that conversation further and I would just recommend you have a read of the report to get a little bit more insight. I think it was a question here. Hi, thank you. Uh, James Davis from uh, CDS. Um, I, my question was sort of related to that last one a little bit as well. And you mentioned that the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, said that you know GDPR shouldn't be a blocker to to collecting any of this kind of data. Um, my understanding of it is that um, the legislation says you should be clear about why you're collecting data yep. at any at the point of collection. So it's kind of a consent thing. Is the problem that that consent is not being asked, or is it is it the service design challenge to sort of build that into the process? I think actually, well, I can only speak to the sort of um, the work that's been done in in the court system context. I think it's the service design challenge of building that in without interrupting the user journey. Like that's been something that's been raised by people that we've spoken to in this context. I think um, the real sort of uh, under there is something really important here about how do you ask for this data in a way that people who are going through these digital pathways understand that it's not going to be factored into the case of that that's a huge issue to overcome mm. then there's the other issue about like cons uh, asking people's consent for information is is really important making sure that they understand why it's being asked but in order for you to collect in but it's not mutually exclusive but in order for you to collect enough data you need to understand how to design it into the user journey to get a good enough response rate that you're able to say something meaningful mm. and I think it's a fault of like as a researcher it's a fault of researchers that everyone's very fond of like doing stuff with the back end of data but when we came to look at what's the best practice in this space it's really like under theorized and underdeveloped like this whole mm. question of how do you collect better data you have ONS harmonised questions on, say, race, for example, but in other areas, like asking questions about um, the about maternity, like there's really no good body of practice still underpinning how you ask people that in a way that gets a response. So I think these are all, um, yeah, huge design challenges. Yeah. Uh, uh Special category data under, G under the GDPR um, requires you to encourages you to uh, undertake a privacy impact assessment and also to define the lawful reason for why you want to collect this data. Now, data for in terms of research uh, um, is, 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 a, is a lawful reason as to why you should collect this information. Um, of course, consent is, in, is, is important as well, but part of what we've encouraged in the recommendations, part of what we found was that if it doesn't have to be linked to the process that you've already had. Uh, as I said about blind applications, you can apply for a job, you can then be asked separately uh, about protected characteristics that, and the two should never meet one another, they should have separate pathways. So um, there are ways of going around doing, going about doing this that organisations already are doing. Uh, um, but as we also recommend for the ICO and the Equalities and Human Rights uh, uh, Commission and other regulators and organisations in this space who do know how to be doing this properly, that, that needs to be collated and presented in a way that's much more easily accessible for those who are designing and building services to know what they can and can't and what they should or shouldn't be doing. Hello, uh, my name is Victoria from an organisation called Black Thrive. Um, so we're currently based in Lambeth and working on a project to look at tackling mental health inequalities across statutory services. Um, and part of our model um, integrates data and basically getting an, um, ethnic, ethnicity data from all the different statutory partners, flipping it over and sharing it with the public so they can use that for advocacy. So one issue that we've come across, and I don't know if this came up in your work, is that sometimes, and it's related to GDPR, sometimes, some, for example, we're working with black communities and in some cases we're seeing that there's disparities with black trans people but we can't share that data and make it flip the other way because there's only maybe two people we're talking about which might make them easily identifiable yeah. and that's crossed the line yeah. and we're actually finding this in various areas like school exclusions and serious youth um, uh, serious uh, knife crime basically so I just wondered if that came up in the work that you were doing around inequalities because they are minorities that are so small mm -hmm. 
that this whole issue around data and sharing data won't actually tackle the inequality because you can't share it. Like, do you, I don't know if that makes kind of sense it and totally whether you've come does. across that. And low self count numbers is a real issue. I guess we've been looking at this in the context of like national government services where they're mm -hmm. huge and um, right. nationwide. And as soon as you get down to smaller areas, I can totally see that that's a concern. May I ask why is it, is the idea that, so it's not enough just to share the finding, just to, to be able to report the experience. You, it's, it's actually wanting to share the precise data of where these things are happening that's causing the problem. This isn't probably one that I can speak to particularly well, but I know there are um, the ICO and others who would have who would have a view on this, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we didn't cover that in this research. This was a very overview, where just chatting to people, trying to put some meat on the bones as to as to what the problem, the starting headline problem is. Um, but final recommendation of let's try and get some more money, you know, for organisations to be able to look more closely at issues that you've raised. Um, hope they can start to uh, interrogate these things much more closely. Yeah. Hi, um, um, I'm Dan from Citizens Advice. Um, given that um, people have the right to say no, um, has there been any suggestion around how uh, service designers can compensate for that when building services, uh, compensate for the data gap to ensure that they are inclusive and fair? That's certainly uh, been thought about within the ODI. Uh, I am absolutely the wrong person to give you <laughs> to give you any insight into that. Uh, um, there are there's more detail in the recommendations that I would uh, uh, encourage you to look at. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yes. I think there needs to be some more sort of difference in difference testing, looking at like different models, um, because question placement, where you put it in the user journey, really matters as to whether people are happy to give you the information. Also depends on who you are and trust. So so, but we don't actually have a good evidence base for how those things play out. Um, there's a brilliant team at HMCTS who've been doing some really thoughtful work and like user testing, looking at what difference to response rate does it make when we place these questions at different parts in the journey. But I would totally echo Renata's point that what we were really shocked at is that 10 years on, we're not a lot further on in understanding how you overcome some of these design challenges and get around those things. So it would certainly be an area that the foundation would be keen to like explore with people who wanted to do a project of that kind because it's so critical. Yeah, yeah understanding why people want to say no uh, and when, because not always, people aren't always going to say no, uh, is important. It comes back around to the point that was made by a number of people we spoke mm -hmm. to that it's not, it's about qualitative data as well. I have the conversation and we might be able to figure it out, which might then be able to help design better. Uh, but having people drop out, uh, opt out, uh, as we also said, don't be scared if you don't have complete data. That in itself will tell you things. Uh, um, and that's, it's, that's hugely important to, for, for us all to, to, to grasp. It, it does, things don't have to be 100% to be able to uh, point out problems or opportunities. I think we have some questions on this side. Um, hi, I'm Molly I'm from HMCTS and have been doing some work on this. And one of the things that we found is that actually people do get asked these questions an awful lot and they, over the years, haven't seen the impact of doing that and they don't understand the change. And there seems to be sort of a risk in everyone asking the questions and then us not collectively showing how we use it and what the change was. So I just wonder if you found any good examples of how organisations have shown what they've done with them. Um, or how we would raise kind of public awareness of the use of this data? Um, well, uh, there's an example within the report about work that was done, uh, as mentioned, rapidly, as I whiz through everything, of uh, citizens' advice and uh, government digital services working together to create, uh, uh, to publish, um, be transparent about a collection of data and how, uh, um, on a dashboard. Um, there's links to that within the report. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. People do get asked all of this. And again, one of the key points we make is be transparent about this. Uh, uh, shine a light on it. Show how uh, the data uh, uh, can help improve services. Um, with the ODI have recently done another piece of work where we've been speaking to people exactly about that. Like, why don't you want to share information about yourself? And not specifically about protected characteristics, but just 
data about ourselves. And often people are like, well, I don't want it to be misused, but then gave us examples of, oh, well, I love it. Well, I love it is a bit strong, but I, I really appreciate it when I receive my uh, council tax uh, letter that shows how my money has been spent in my area or how blood that I gave has been used in X, Y, and Z hospitals. So people, if, if, if organizations share and are transparent about how data is being used and the opportunities that come th through it, people's understanding and appreciation of that will, will, will grow, but that's part of the literacy conversation. I, I don't know. I think it's a political will conversation as well, isn't it? Because if you collect this data from people at the front end and then you do the analysis of, there are, you know, people who are delivering these systems who could rightly feel, you know, who could worry about the impact on trust in them of things being, I feel like, of things being revealed that perhaps they didn't necessarily want to see. So I think there's something there about building political will and also building the body of evidence that shows when, if you look at medicine, for example, where they've collected um, ethnicity data on um, prescription rates, and um, that data revealed huge sort of differences in the way in which um, practitioners were treating individuals from black and ethnic minority communities versus their um, white patients. but. The sky didn't fall in. Nobody saw any headlines saying, like, racist doctors, we need to get rid of them all. Actually, the issue was, the bias was exposed. And then the fact that it had been pointed out meant that it went away. And so there's, alongside the building practice in, um, in the sort of collection, there's this whole question of how do we build the political will around the transparency at the other end? Because I absolutely agree with you, Molly. If we're just asking people to provide this and then they never see what's done with it and it isn't fed into it, the loop doesn't get closed, then you lose people's trust and then they don't provide you with the information. It's a vicious cycle. So, thank you. Any more questions? From here. Do we have any questions from Twitter? An hour. Well, thank you. It's been uh, it's been it's been a delight. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, yeah. I hope this has been of interest. And please do read the report because it fills in all the gaps where that I've missed out. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.